Welcome back, everybody, to the Weapons of Mass Discussion podcast. Lynn Snyder here on the phone with me again, Dr. Corbett Everidge. Uh, kind of got a couple. Hello. Hello. Hey, like, you like, you like that British thing, don't you? Darn <laughs> hey, we, First chance I get, I'm going, man. Uh, <laughs> I know. You keep saying that. Keep saying that. One day I'm going to call, get you to call in, and the time zone is going to be different. Do that on go to New Zealand while I can shear some sheep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, some of the things that you say sometimes uh, it makes me it makes me worry just a little bit. Hey, yeah, there's, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I firmly believe there's a market for sheepskins condoms. Uh, oh, okay. I've, I'm not even yeah. not even going down. I'm not even taking the bait on that one. <laughs> yeah, the beef eater. <laughs> but uh, so, <clears throat> kind of where we're going to go tonight is. Uh, you're thinking about it, ain't you? <laughs> <laughs> you didn't throw it off my whole groove here. We're talking about that damn sheep. Uh, well, I'll tell you what. Before we get started, let me say this: um, in the past past few weeks, we've really we've been getting a lot more. You know, we 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 picked up subscribers, and on the the podcast, we've got on the audio ver- version of it. We've gotten a lot of new new listeners. And again, as always, we want to say, hey, thank you guys very much. We appreciate Absolutely. it, and. Uh, um, you know, it, it kind of shows, okay, this the work that we put into this, you know, the time and effort we put into it is 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 sowing seeds, and it's 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 worth it. You know, it's 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 doing something and hopefully helping somebody else out there. And the feedback we get's been good. So, uh, first and foremost, thank all you guys. <clears throat> so, topic of conversation today. Um, this is really, uh, I would say, more in in, in the expertise arena. For, for Corbett, but um, if you've watched any news in the last year and you see a lot of things happen, uh, uh, events, you know, people getting hurt, injured, and and usually the perpetrator uh, after the fact, we always say, well, this person had mental issue problem, you know, mental problems. They had they had things going on that that you know, people knew. That, well, we thought, oh, the guy had something kind of going on, but we just really didn't think nothing about it. Blah blah blah. Um. You know, there's all sorts of things, you know, chemically, somebody could have wrong with them. There could be instances in people's life, something that's happened that's triggered, it, you know, them to act or, or be a certain way. And you just don't know that. You know, you don't know who you're sitting next to, at, you know, across the aisle from at the restaurant. You don't know who you're, you know, you're at the gas pump next to at the gas station when you're pumping your car. You don't know who, you know, could be walking past you going into or out of the store. Um, and, and, you know, un, you know, trying to understand, you, you're not going to understand every the way everybody thinks, the way everybody, you know, the way their mind works. But you know, there are I think signs of things when you're dealing with people. Um, and I'm not saying in a, necessarily in a violent situation, but just in general, you know, communication with people. Sometimes you can sort of see and get and, and see and kind of understand that something is not quite right here something's not quite you know what and i guess and i'm putting in air quotes uh quote unquote normal behavior um so that's kind of the path we're going to be. we're talking some more like mental mental capacity and we kind of roll that into you know self self-defense and self-protection that sort of thing but uh so i'm going to turn it over to you and let you kind of kick this conversation off and i will fill in as i can on it so uh, yeah, I just got go. towed down the stairs. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you, you you have you have way more. You, know, you actually have educational background in this. I mean, you know, uh, your 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 professional life. Um, you know, you spent the last you know, twenty plus years. You know, pretty much dealing with a lot of people, kind of in that world. And you know, so it, it, for me, it's 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 a it's a byproduct of the things that I've studied and learned and had to deal with. But for you, it's it's sort of been a kind of a you know, one of the main things that you've had to deal with in your professional life. So, um, yeah, not to well, throw you, not to throw you under the bus or down the stairs, but yeah, I just hey, did. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, and you know, and I'm gonna preface this. You know, I, I, I there's some things I can't disclose because I mean, I, I do sure. presently work in and around a facility that is a secure mental health facility. Um. And in the past, you know, when I was a judicial official, I did work with, you know, the, the involuntary commitment process. And we'll briefly talk about that because, you know, Glenn, this is my opinion. I, I do not have any data or any 
you know, scholarly research, if there is such a thing anymore. This is all how I see the world based on what I think, you know, what I want everybody to think of right now. And this just does not deal with mental illness. It goes with life in general. It's very, it, there's a very simple way of looking and see and, and understanding the world is open your eyes and open your ears. Yep. Uh, in, we, we hear you know, over the past 50 to some odd years what's happened in, in, with, 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 and I'm using our fingers, quote, mentally ill people. That means, you know, there's, there's somehow diseased in the mind. And that has taken on a very, very drastic turn. And, 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 and I don't know about, you know, with our friends, you know, that listen to us, you know, from various parts of the world. But I'm speaking specifically here in, in America and more specifically here in North Carolina. Yeah. We have completely, in my opinion, redefined the mental illness to where now it, it technically does not mean anything anymore. Um, yeah, in, in my in my opinion, uh, I think there's been a lot of abandonment of those people that really need help. I mean, you know, the, the closing closing the 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 treatment facilities and things that you know when we were growing up there, like in Raleigh, you know, you know there was a a, a big treatment facility in Dorothy the, Dix. Yep, and so you know stuff like that, that, that those things no longer exist, and so and, I, I think that's doing people that need help a disservice. Well. <clears throat> If there's anybody in the medical profession listening to this, I'm you're. I want to go ahead and tell you straight. You're going to be deeply, deeply offended and wounded by this conversation, but it's one we have to have, because Glenn, I, I could not agree with you more. I, I am a firm believer that what we should do as a society, you, and you make any political argument you want, is we need to bring back insane asylums. And I'm not saying you know you know, shove electrical cattle prods up people's rectums. Right. You know, lock them in closets. That 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 is morally reprehensible. Right. What I'm saying is is we we should be bringing back facilities, meaning hospitals or or or, or treatment, well, however you want to phrase it. Right. State of the art, you know, creature comforts, you know, uh, good food, uh, high high quality medical care where these people are treated with, with dignity and respect, you know, compassion and above all love. Right. They're still human beings. Right. They, I mean, let's, we, we cannot ever forget that as I don't, you know, I wouldn't care if there's somebody in one of these places that is Michael Myers, that is still a flesh and blood, blood human being. And until they have crossed the line to where they have committed a criminal offense, which that's where the problem arises now. I want to give that person the benefit of the doubt and they need to be treated, you know, for what they are, which is, which is a human being that with you know, that, that is deserving of love and respect. Right. You know, the vast majority of people and you can go through the DSM, the, the, you know, that's, that used to be the Bible of mental illness. You know, it laid out all of the, uh, what could be wrong, you know, schizophrenia, you know, it used to be called manic depression. I think now they call it bipolar. Yeah, it's funny how the Any, same, the same, the same <clears throat> diseases or things like that. How they, the, the same things just change names, but it's the well, same, same thing. And and even with the names of the facilities now, it, it, you know, twenty years ago, <clears throat> when I was just getting, you know, rolling in this career, we called the psych unit. Right. Don't do that anymore. It's called behavioral health. Right. And just by the way we phrase things, it, it is meant to, to take the stigma off of, of something and, and to place it in a more positive, less less caustic and, and you know, a less damaging light to that person as far as their reputation and their psyche. Right. That that sounds noble but it doesn't solve the problem. Right. One of the things I will, I will look at is as far as is what we're looking at is two things illegal. And because this is, we're dealing primarily with, with, with self-defense, self-protection and, and crime in general. 
that I see that where we have we are going down a very dangerous path here in the United States is the legalities looking at, at mental illness as far as how we treat these people, what we do with them once we take them into custody to seek treatment, possibly against their will, because we do have a process where you can be taken against your will to be evaluated. Right. And the signs, because there are certain signs you will see. And this is aggression in general, but more specifically that they are, they are looking at as far as people who are quote unquote mentally ill. And, you know, there's in the facility where I work, you know, like I said, I work in and around one. And we've we've got the ones in, in our, our location to where people know this person is liable to, to explode at any given time. Right. And as a caveat to that, a couple of them, I don't think are mentally ill in, in any stretch of the imagination. I think they're very cunning. I think they are, if you can say, scheming, manipulative. It, it's, it's more of a cognitive process to what they've learned through the criminal underworld, and it's not a disease of the mind. It's more of a con. Yes. <clears throat> that, that, is my, that is my opinion. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm, a, I'm, I'm not a mud. I'm a thud. Right. But being around criminals my adult my whole adult life and seeing this, there are some things that you key in on, like I'll give you an example of how to con somebody out of food. Okay. You start to act like you're getting sick or you or or you start to get very agitated, or this person is constantly pestering or badgering medical staff you know i want cookies and it's just a constant constant barrage of requests and demands and what it is is a manipulation to see how far they can push you mm -hmm. and to see how far they can go to get what they want you know That's if like i have to ask eight times to get an orange juice <clears throat> Well, gotcha. what you've done is you've established a baseline. Yes. This person knows, okay, if I badger them a certain, in a certain way and ask a certain number of times, I will get X. Right. It's like, like a kid. Right. It, it, you see that a lot with, with men who have abused women, and they may have a, a, a civil or, or some type of domestic violence order against them, and... You've heard me counsel women on this before. As, as a matter of fact, I've, I've got, you know, some ladies I've been talking to recently that that kind of knocked them off guard when I said this, but he called me 10 times on the 11th one. I just couldn't take it anymore. I answered the phone and cussed him out. Well, when you've got a person that's obsessing over something like that, you can't meet them on your level of, of cognitive behavior and your mental process right they're not playing that game they're playing their own game so you're sitting here calling him everything but a child of god don't call me this that and the other the signal you just sent this person is to get to talk to her the price is 11 phone calls right you have to completely rewire your thought process to understand people who are either mentally ill or they are something that the world could do without. Yeah, overly aggressive to some extent with some for some reason. Right. So having said that, you know, I will go back to my magistrate days and, and, and explain a couple things for those of you who may not be familiar with our, our legal process. It's called an involuntary commitment procedure. And this is this is predominantly pertaining to the state of North Carolina and other states. It may be different. And like I said, for those of you overseas, you might not even have this, but we do. And I will say this legally, it is extraordinarily dangerous to for the person and for the person 
who is enforcing the order. I'm, I'm talking on legal consequences. So let's say that I expect, or, you know, you know, I expect Glenn to do something dangerous, or I suspect he's, he's, you know, he may have, he's seen some bad things in his life and he's got the PTSD and I'm not going to step in that tonight because I will greatly offend people on my views on that. Right. <clears throat> but it is something we have to acknowledge. The way the law reads is they have to be, and, and I will say this, when you're studying law of any stripe, there's three very dangerous words, and, or, and shall. If you see those three words, you need to pay attention to them. Because if it says and, you have to have two things put together. You can't have one or the other. Okay. Okay. If you have or, you can have one or the other. And if it says shall, if there is no discretion for the officer, for the court official, for the medical caregiver, or anybody, when the law states the person shall do X, Y, and Z, that is clear what has to be done. Mm -hmm. So if you see those three words in a, in a statute, criminal, civil, or otherwise, okay. you need to pay attention. So our, the way our, our law reads here in North Carolina for, for an involuntary commitment procedure states that this person has to be mentally ill and mentally ill and dangerous to himself or herself or others. Hmm. So the first thing that we have to establish is they have to be mentally ill. Okay. We've got to establish that. And then we have to combine that with them being dangerous to themselves or somebody else. So they could be severely depressed. They could be hearing voices. They could be having flashbacks from a, a traumatic combat experience. They could be having flashbacks from something they experienced as a child uh, from severe abuse and trauma. Right. Those are things we key in on for the mental, il mental illness. And then we got to go mental illness and dangerous to themselves. Have they threatened suicide? Have they attempted suicide? Have they been acting strangely as far as with a fascination of weapons? guns, uh, razor blades, poisons. Uh, have you noticed that they are keeping prescription medications that, that don't belong to them? Or are they making threats to other people right. and doing some of the same behaviors? It used to be a pretty clear cut, you know, legal, legal standard. I'm quickly learning that's not the case anymore. Generally, what I would do, because here's the way this works in, in North Carolina, again, let's say you're the, you're, you're the nut job, and I go down to a local magistrate or I go in front of a, of a district court judge or I go in front of the clerk of court, and I, I swear in to give testimony and, and tell them what's going on with you. Right. What I'm doing is I'm seeking, number one, hopefully, to get you some sort of help to, to – to, to at least get you on the right path to where we can correct these issues in your life. We hope that, that a person is doing this for the right reasons to, is to get you help. Right. Sell them the case, but that's, we got to give the benefit of the doubt to the, to the, to the general assembly and our lawmakers that that's the way this law was originally designed. And, and that's what it was. It's true intent was. So we go down and we present our testimony. Generally, what I would look at is I looked at things like, okay, we are we looking at something? Are they severely depressed? Are they manic? Tell me about their behaviors. Tell me about are they seeing anybody? Have they what have they experienced in their life? Have they sought medical treatment or are they seeking counseling? And then we look at the dangerous aspects of it. What have they done? We actually have to ask that question. What have they done? Well, he's threatening me. 
a key that I looked at on all of these cases when I was sitting in that chair and I was making the decision on whether or not to issue these orders was time. When did this happen? That was a couple of weeks ago. Well, what makes this an emergency tonight? Because this is an emergency procedure. Right. Well, why, where have you been for two weeks? Right. And that's where people would get very angry. Now, I, I, I just didn't want to go through with this. Well, you're here now. And you've, you've, anytime folks, and, I, and this, this, again, disclaimer, you're not taking, I'm not giving legal advice. If you take it as legal advice, put some soap on, put, you know, put a rope on your soap. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Everybody just understand that and let's move along. This is an opinionated discussion. Right. Anytime you call the police, anytime you involve lawyers or you involve the courts, what you have done in a, you know, de facto, you have given up your rights and ability to control the destiny of your life. You need to understand that. And if you don't, then there's no hope for you. But what you've done is when you came to somebody like me, in a, in a sense, what you're saying is I've lost control of this and I can't control it anymore. So I need help. I need help. And there's nothing wrong with it. Right. But you need to understand that aspect that what you have done now is you have surrendered control of one aspect of your life to a disinterested, and I do mean that disinterested third party <clears throat> right. who is going to pl- uh, pl- apply a, pro- a very objective and probably a very cynical view of this aspect of your life and they're going to handle it accordingly. If you don't like that, don't proceed. Right. I know that's blunt, but I have to tell you out of love, that's the way this works. That's reality. That's reality. If you have a problem with your neighbor and well, I didn't want the cops to arrest him. Well, then what did you call them for? Right. They're not just coming to mediate. Yeah, they're, 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 the police are not they're Exactly. You're exactly right. right. That was very well put. They're not mediators. Yeah. You know, you call a law enforcement officer to your property to, to settle any kind of dispute with your neighbors. Don't get mad at them when they solve it. So please, everybody understand that. You know, you, you can mole on lobby and don't tread on me all that all you want. But any time you call the police or any time you go hire an attorney to sue somebody or you want to go pop tall in front of the judge in, in, in the courtroom, you have, in fact, been tread upon and your molon did not get lobbied. <laughs> that's right. Okay. That's just the way that is. You know, you know, you put that in your beard and comb it. And so the problem with that now is we've had a very severe distortion in what we look at as mental illness. It's no secret that we have an enormous problem with drug abuse in this country. Yes. I was talking to a lady the other night that's a medical professional, and we were talking about an unrelated issue. We was actually talking about the George Floyd case. But we kind of morphed into about and this is my firm belief that America, we, we do not have a inequality problem. We do not have a racial problem. We do not have a, what we have is a spiritual problem. We have lost our way. Yeah. Spiritually, we've turned our back on God. We have turned our back on morality and decency. And for anybody who doubts that or like, ha ha, this, this holy roller. Well, then let me ask you to do just something very simple. I want you to rewind the clock, if you're able to do so, 20 to 30 years. And I want you to be very honest with me and yourself. Have we gotten better or worse as a society? Worse. Far worse. Way worse, and yeah. There, there's a, there, there is one major characteristic of what used to be common in American society that is becoming less and less important to a lot of people. And that's religious faith. Right. And I don't I don't care what stripe that may be. You may be a Christian, you may be Jewish, you may be Muslim, you may be a Scientologist, it does not matter. But it's openly being ridiculed and mocked and 
it's no accident by looking at the state of our society. Right. Shut, give me another variable as to why this has happened. I'm all ears. But having said that about alcoholism, drug abuse, what we are beginning to see now in the field is more and more medical providers are beginning to look at behaviors and treating them as a mental illness rather than for what they are, which is criminal offense. Mm. A young man pulls a butcher knife on his grandma. Well, let's have him, let's have him looked at. Let's have him evaluated. So what they will do is then you got certain, because we don't have these state hospitals anymore, we've got all these private facilities. Right. And guess who's paying for that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that's the, that's the, the, you know, the one thing nobody really wants to talk about. Well, we have these, the, these just enormous numbers of private facilities, but what they do is they get very selective. They know they're going to get paid by, you know, by insurance companies or Medicare, Medicaid, whatever the case may be. Right. But also they have a right to refuse people based on their behavior. Ah, they get to pick and yeah. choose. They do. They do. They still that get is paid. The dirt, that they do, and that's the dirty little secret. Ah, and there's probably not, I mean, there's probably less oversight. I mean, mean, I'm sure there's regulation, but at the same time, I mean, uh, a private facility, you know, know, one facility could operate differently than another facility and operate different than another facility, which means that could be a fluctuation in the care that the person receives, you know, so I, I, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. No, well, you're exactly right. But here's the problem with this is because if you bring us, if you're a law enforcement officer and you have, and you come arrest me, when I issued that order, let's say that I found, okay, this person, yeah, okay, let's just err on the side of caution and have this person looked at. The order I issued as a magistrate in the state of North Carolina gave you as a law enforcement officer the legal authority to go take this person away from their home against their will. It's not an arrest but it gave you the authority to take this person against their will before a, a medical doctor with, you know, in due time and have them by evaluated to see if, if they were in fact mentally ill and dangerous to themselves or others and could benefit from treatment. That's what that, that's, a, that was the end of my responsibility as, as a, as a judicial official. Right. I gave you the authority to take this person to a medical doctor. In North Carolina, the medical doctor makes the decision on whether or not, whether to or not, place this person in a in a facility for mental for mental health treatment. Right. Here's the problem: is we just spoke about the selectivity of the process. Well, what happens when you've got a person who is violent and is a dangerous to danger to themselves or others, and is in fact mentally ill, but because of the selective nature of these private facilities, they won't take these people. So they go right back to the house. No, no, that that would that that's what should happen. Oh, okay. That's what should happen. Okay. They leave them right there, indefinitely. Really? Yes. Okay. Legally, there's a problem with that because now you're not getting the person treatment, nor are you treating them. And you've already got a person who's violent. Now you've put them in there, and you're and they and they're saying, "When am I going home? I have no idea." Well, when am I going to a hospital? I have no idea. Well, what are they going to do with me? I don't know. Oh wow! And what you're doing is this is like a pressure cooker. Yep. You just wired a bomb to uh to start the countdown at that point. Yes, you did. You took it. You, I mean, it, it literally is like the old Bugs Bunny cartoons where you, you lift the fuse on the dynamite and it's going, and it, it just starts eating away. Yeah. That's what happens daily in this state. Wow. Now, legally, I would argue, now again, I'm a PhD. I'm not, I'm not a lawyer, but because I'm, Actually, I have critical thinking skills, unlike they teach you in law school. <laughs> yeah, get that jab in there, do you? <laughs> yeah. Lawyers are lawyers are, are junkyard dogs. Let, let's just put this in context. When I hire a lawyer, it's to apply the law in my favor. Let's just be very honest about this. Right. 
Your job is to defend me at all costs. Yeah. You are a junkyard dog. I put the chain on your neck. You bark and you keep people away from me. That's the, that's the purpose of a lawyer. Right. Now that we got that out of the way. So we look at this. Explain to me then if you're not actively treating this person other than just sticking a shot in their arm or giving them a pill to keep them asleep 18, 19 hours a day, and that does happen. Or you're not putting them in a place where they can receive counseling and treatment. Explain to me legally what authority do you have to keep this person in any place whatsoever against their will? Right. Their actions notwithstanding. Wow. And they will do so, and well, it's public safety. Okay, then charge them with a crime. The problem with that is, is because now that you have you have stigmatized this person, saying they have been committed. Now you cannot charge them with a crime because what you now has gave them a defense to that action. Oh wow! What's a multi-tier problem here, boy? Yes, and it is out of control, my friend. Wow. Now, looking at that, and we look at some of the things as far as, uh, you know, you hear this all the time. Well, uh, he was so quiet, and, you know, we never, you know, we had no idea. Yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yes, you did. Uh-huh. You know, there used to be, a, and I'm going to throw dirt on everybody here, me, me included. The neighborhood I live in, there's, you know, we live out in the middle of nowhere. But on the road I live on, there's about 10 houses, and that's it. I know every person on this road. Now, some of them I might not know as well as I do my immediate neighbors. Right. But when I walk my dogs every day, or when I'm running, if I if I choose, instead of going to the park, if I choose to run here, if they're out in the yard... I know I, I can literally stop and carry on a conversation and at least know a little bit about this person. Right. We don't have that anymore. I would ask, you know, some of you who live in, in the burbs, in the suburbs, or, or if you're still dumb enough to live in a city, give me the names of four of your neighbors and give me one detail about their life. Yeah. We can't do that anymore. And that is catastrophic from a social and cultural perspective. Yeah, you're right, but, man. Because growing up, you know, I grew up in a development, you know, that was probably 16 houses on the road. And uh, we knew everybody on the road. And we knew everybody. Everybody knew every, everybody's parents, all the kids. Uh, you you knew either the stay home moms you knew you knew what the dads you knew what the parents did for work I mean everybody knew everything about everybody it was everybody mm-hmm. was in, intertangled and entwined even though you may not you know go over and hang out you know everybody knew everybody that, and you're right that is now obviously my situation is a little different because I'm surrounded by all my family mm-hmm. but you know growing up you know, where we lived yeah absolutely and you do you do not see that anymore at I mean, all you go to a like an apartment building, you know. The one, one. The, I lived one time in a in a in a townhome community, and I had a two story townhouse. And I, the one I lived in was a duplex. So I shared one house. I shared, you know, basically it was it was two houses separated by a wall. Right. I knew her, and I knew her her live-in boyfriend, and honestly, to this day, I can't remember their names. I don't really remember a lot about them, and what it would be was like, because I worked strange hours, I would be coming in in the morning as they would be going to work. Yeah. But as far as, you know, hey, let's borrow a cup of sugar, or, you know, hey, we're going to throw some burgers out on the grill, why don't y'all come over? That never happened. Right. We ha- we are losing that part of our of our 
of our culture and it's having devastating consequences on recognizing when something's wrong because to recognize when something's wrong you got to know when things are right right well let, if let, you don't let, let, yes. let, let me let me chime in on this just I'm gonna, I'm gonna i'm gonna start bitching about something here and now that you say that and this is my opinion my thoughts on why, why one reason we're like that now, people have become so antisocial. And I'm here. Here's what I'm going to blame. The thing I like to bitch about a whole lot, it, it social media. People mm -hmm. want to live and connect with people virtually. Nobody wants to physically talk to anybody. They don't want, don't want to pick up the phone. They don't want to walk next door. They don't want to have to deal with people in person. Oh, that's nice. And I can just ignore that text, or I can ignore that email, or I can, you know, I, they don't, you know. There's no antisocial and the fact that people don't want to be close to people anymore. And, and I blame it on, I, again, I blame it on that social media mentality, that social media culture where it's just, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll communicate with people from afar, even though they're like a, in the back seat of the car. If, if, for those of you out there that have had teenagers and have seen that in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm going, I'm living that right now. So, so I think that 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 to me is another huge problem that's probably leading to a lot of this. It is, in my opinion, and and I agree. I I, I think yeah, you know, I think you're 100 percent correct on that. It's not a single scope problem. You've got that, I, and and let's put this in context because this year is you know we're slated to have our 30 year high school reunion. Right. Are we going to have it? Uh, uh, exactly. No clue. Right. <laughs> you know, no clue. Right. You know, you know, because you got COVID, you know, because now everybody's scared out of their underpants about that. Yeah. But aside from that, you know, if you were to, if you were to peruse Facebook or something like that, I have as many people as you and I crossed paths with that we went to high school with. Right. And here's the big part of it. Is it even necessary anymore? You know, a reunion used to be, you know, like a family reunion, you know, with, with your yeah. very distant family, you get together once a year, you know, rekindle those relationships. Right. You know, what's going on, you know, you know, how, what's changed in your life. That's not even necessary anymore because you can go on Facebook, you can go on Instagram or, or, or whatever you you pick one. Yeah. And you can, it's like you said, you can look at this person like they're in a fishbowl. Yep. You don't have to touch them. You don't, you don't even necessarily, you know, have to feed them. You can just sit there and watch them live in their life in this little bubble. And you don't have to get your hands dirty. Yeah. And it is literally destroying how we interact with one another. Yep. And you have a whole generation coming up now and that's how they've been raised. Right. You know, and we're seeing the tail end of it because, you know, we're older and we experience life in a whole different way, like, you know, like our parents did. But this, uh, the, you know, kids, let's say kids anywhere, it ranges, well, any kid from zero to right now to about, say, 22, 23, 24. Yeah, they've been, they've lived through that lens. And I think that's a huge problem. And I think, and I think at least, again, to, 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 and I hate to say it, mental illness, <laughs> you know, well, yeah, separation from people is not good for you. You know, some of the stuff that I research, I mean, you know this about because of something you got out of the post office box this week. Yes, I need to get that to I, you, by the I, way. <laughs> I, I, I delve into some pretty dark stuff. Yeah. And when I say dark, I mean, you know, you feel free to back me up on this, but when I say dark, some of this stuff, I don't even let it near my house. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's, I'm not using the word creepy, but these, it's it's it's, it's crazy are some stuff. Yeah, extraordinarily dangerous people. Yeah. But you look at some things like I was reading something the other day. You know, kind of piqued my interest is about lower birth rates, and a couple of in, uh, of stories later, it was talked about this guy somewhere out in California. And he was going to, I think, Japan, and he was going to a convention on actually where he had found a way to implant artificial intelligence, AI, into these sex dolls. They were real live sex dolls. Oh. I mean, it looks... No, 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 no. This, this, this is disturbing. Oh, God. Okay. To where 
had a chip in it and you know you had a remote control and you could make this thing talk to you and what we've done now we don't even have to have sex with another human being you know gay straight doesn't matter i'm you you know well you pick your poison i'm not here to i'm not here to debate that tonight that's for another day but you can go out and spend you know i don't even know what these things cost five ten twenty grand who knows Good Lord. You hang it up in the closet, and, and when you need an itch, when you got an itch and need scratching, you hit the play button, and off and it's off to the races. Oh, my God. And you wonder why we've got societies that are collapsing because not, you're not replenishing them. Right. That's a problem. So the big thing about that is we don't even know what a baseline for standard and rational behavior is in our own communities anymore. We have no idea. When's the last time, and I, I'm, I'm going to issue you everybody a challenge. When's the last time you actually walked and you was out mowing your yard and you saw your neighbor and you said, you know what, I'm going to see what he's been up to lately. I can tell you exactly what my neighbors are up to. Me too. You know, you know, my next door neighbor, if you face my house to my right, you know, he's recovering from a stroke. You know, my next door neighbor to my left, she just lost her fiance. And died unexpectedly. But it's because we actually stand out and talk to one another in the yard. Yeah. But you see all these stuff. Well, he was just such a quiet guy. Well, then you got to start asking very unqu- uncomfortable questions. Was he com- was he quiet or was he just you just didn't you talk didn't, to us exactly? Yeah, you know because you go back through history, Glenn. Some of the some of the of the most prolific serial killers we've ever known were very very social people. Yeah, had families. Yeah, John yeah. Wayne Gacy actually had his picture made with Rosalind Carter. Wow. You know, Ted Bundy was a very charming individual. So that part of the puzzle does not fit. It's because we are not paying attention. But things as far as, as I'm going to give two things. These are two things I look that when I, that I start paying attention to, like this person might be getting ready to, to, to go off. They start pacing. They will start walking back and forth and and it, it will be, in very, very premeditated, rapid movements. You'll see a lot of this if you watch when people start getting upset in places like retail establishments. If you've watched somebody who is not getting what they want or they think they're being mistreated or they're not getting the service they desire, watch their physical characteristics and watch it to see if they don't start. And it may be just a, a few feet, you know, a few feet in either direction but they'll start pacing. And then the tail of when something's getting ready to happen is when they stop and they go into something called the set. Whoever's going to get be on the receiving end of what's getting ready to happen, they'll face the person and they'll go and watch what they'll call a set where they may, you know, they may step back into their dominant side. You'll see them lock eyes. They start to, okay, I'm going to pick a target. And you'll start to see them sizing this person up. What am I going to hit first? Usually throughout my career working in, in, in facilities where there were mentally, but when we saw that, yeah. if you waited till it got to that point, it was too late. Yeah. Uh, you know, person may got, may start sweating profusely. They may get real quiet. Uh, their their eyebrows may furrow, you know. They 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 may squint their eyes, but all those things that 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 you know, when we if you've worked in a prison or especially if you've worked in a secure mental health facility, when you start seeing those things happen, you, you need notice. to start exactly because something is is bothering. This something has got this person agitated, and they're either trying to blow off steam or they're getting ready to blow off. Yeah. You know, you look, 
because and, and I and I can't stress this enough because we have so diluted our language in America. I can't speak for other countries. I'm speaking specifically about America now. Right. What does mental health even mean? You know, well, he's mentally ill because in North Carolina also, if you're issued an involuntary commitment, law enforcement can, on court order, seize your firearms. Yeah. They can. Now, there's a process through the Veterans Administration to where, you know, I am a veteran. And, you know, if I saw a fellow veteran say, you know, he's just not acting right, you know, he's something's bothering him, and somebody knows he's a veteran, it just does not have to be another veteran. This could be any person, you know, in existence. They can call that, call a number through the Veterans Administration, and they'll dispatch law enforcement to investigate. Mm. And guess what happens then? Take your stuff. They take your stuff. Mm. Yep. Oh. Um, Yeah. This is my opinion alone. Yeah. Take this for what it's worth. Mm. Mental illness, when somebody does something violently, is an explosion. Now, I'll give you an example of the past, over the recent past. I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. We've had a couple of violent issues where we were our work, and we had, you know, there were very, very few indicators of what was getting ready to happen. There were indicators, but they were very, very few. Now, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that let's just take the, the, the previous shooting out in um, Las Vegas. Okay. You're going to have a very difficult time convincing me of a person that could pull that off that's, that, that's mentally ill because there had to be some level of rational thought in the planning stage to pull that off. Oh, oh a whole lot of forethought and right. planning to pull that off. You know, you had to remove a pane of glass that weighed several hundred pounds to be able to fire into that crowd. Not to mention the fact that you had to somehow smuggle thousands of rounds of ammunition and the firearms right past hotel staff which probably included security and surveillance systems yeah vegas is one of the probably one of the most surveilled cities in the united states yeah yes absolutely i agree so either this person was very good at what they did and not to mention they had to make multiple trips right so it wasn't over the course of an hour. This was over the you know, course of days. So, you know, you 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 take a case of five hundred rounds of and, and I, what what weapon did the guy use? It was a, was an AR. <clears throat> there was multiple ones. Yeah, I can't remember. Mm. It, regardless, right? By a case of five hundred to a thousand rounds of that of, of five five six, it's not heavy, but it's not light either. Yeah, and it makes noise. You're going to notice if somebody's lugging th something through the through the through the lobby. Yeah, that weighs that, and then they're no okay. Well, this this guy's this makes his eighth time carrying something heavy through the lobby. Hmm, he must be drinking a lot of wine coolers. Yeah. No, no. Again, let's go back to what we talked about a while ago. You're not paying attention. That's right. Turn the other cheek. Not right. my problem. Exactly. You know. You you look at the the issues of these school shootings. And a couple, a couple podcasts ago, what did I tell you was going to happen? Oh yeah, <clears throat> there would be a, there would be a shooting in a school. What happened within seven days? Uh huh. That was another shooting at a school. Yes. What what the problem with this, Glenn, is is they're looking for solutions in the wrong places. You want to stop drugs in school? It's not hard to do. It's, it's actually pretty simple when you stop and think about it. Is textbooks, you do away with them and make them do buy something called a Kindle or a or put an app on their tablet, and they're called ebooks. Mm -hmm. They're cheaper. 
They serve the same function. And what you've done now is you've eliminated the, the need for something called a bag. Yep. You've eliminated lockers. Yep. You limit the ways in and out of that school where they have to go through. And you ha- if you're going to place mechanisms of security in schools, then let's put our teachers to work. You're going to stand there and you're going to man metal detectors in the morning. Yeah. Well, they, they get into the door. Well, uh, I, I can help you out on that. You know, in the old days, it was called, you know, perimeter security. They've got these wonderful inventions. I know where you're going with this one. Yeah, they, they, they're fascinating, folks. <laughs> There's ways to keep people. It's called layered security. Is the further away from you you can stop something, the more time you have to counter that attack or react to it or stop it altogether. They've got these wonderful inventions called fences and gates. Yeah. Oh, we can't do that. Oh, yeah, that would uh, yeah. th- that'd just be wrong. Make yeah, them feel you know, like prisoners. Right. Yeah, okay. You know, <laughs> but oh, God. how much of this does it stop? Yeah. Well, we can't be sure. Well, right now you're correct. We can't be sure because you're too damn lazy and stingy to do it. Right? Yeah, that's right. So what have we got to lose? The the mechanisms are there. Am I saying it's going to stop every determined intruder? No, it's not. Right. But there's mechanisms in place. You go through history also, Glenn, and you look at somebody like Let's go with uh, Timothy McVeigh, who, who who was Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. Right, mentally ill, or was he just a very calculating and cold-blooded individual? I say calculated, and cold-blooded. Now, don't you think about this? And there are the conspiracy theories. Oh, he couldn't have done this shot. Well, okay, okay, oh, whatever. Right. I'll meet you halfway, and you know we'll have that discussion at a later date. But for right now, we're going to go with the official narrative and say he did it. So this guy has the wherewithal to build a a just a massive explosive device, and is able to surreptitiously, meaning sneakily, secretly, get this in front of a federal building. Yeah. And detonate that device when he detonate that device when he's safely gotten away from it. And oh well, he's he's crazy as a bed bug. No, uh, no, no, okay, no, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that don't quite wash, does it? No, no. I, I'm sorry, but you know you have to you have to almost believe. And and as a, I'm going to say this as a as a as a person who who has received a doctorate degree in criminology, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a medical doctor, but I am going to say this: a lot of what we have today in our body of knowledge comes at a price because it has some. It comes from somebody who has a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. Right. Peer review. Well, that's that that studies balderdash. That that yeah. can't be true. Yeah. Well, why? Because it goes against everything you've ever said. Exactly. It it doesn't wash because you're biased against it. Right. So now you understand why I not why I refuse. I steadfastly refuse to set foot as a professor on a college campus ever again. Right. Because you're not seeking truth. You're not seeking knowledge. You're seeking. To, to maintain what you believe to be true. Right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, you know, mental illness, I read something by an author one time and, and I still don't, I, I still have not made my decision on how I, I feel or think about this. And I'm going to throw this out just to, just to raise some people's gander. Okay. Because some of you, this is going to raise that raise the hair on your back. He characterized mental illness as a character deficiency. Hmm. Okay. Weakness. I'm not, I'm not supporting that decision. 
I, or, or that statement. I'm, I'm not supporting it. I'm not refuting it. I'm just putting it out there that there is a, and this is a very learned individual in the sciences. Right. And his evidence was, let's look at how combat is affecting this generation of soldiers versus the number of soldiers who came back for what we knew as shell shock or, or you know, you know, PTSD, those that that line that mode of thinking. Yeah. Now versus World War Two. Were yeah. they stronger men? Were they weaker men? Were, was there was there? We have obviously got more knowledge about mental mental disease and, and what trauma does to people. So why is it more widespread now? That's a good. That's a really good point. My theory on it is is yes. I think it probably the horrors of combat probably impacted our generation soldiers equally as it did back then. The problem with it is now is you have a group of people who have a vested interest in making sure that our people now are labeled and stigmatized. Oh, it creates jobs. It does. And it also yeah. creates an opportunity to where if you have an engineered social, uh, I'm, I'm having to be very careful with my words here. Right. An engineered social reversal on what we know and believe to be true as far as how men are to behave as men in society. And what better way to do that than to portray them as weak mm. and damaged? That is a, that's a very profound thought. It's not it's not anything to do with the person and their experience. No, this has to do with the people that are painting that, yes. painting with them with that brush. Right. It has. Please understand me, folks. I'm not saying anything negative about right the combat person. No. Because they have what they are experiencing is real. I experienced it with my dad on one occasion over some things he saw. My grandfather was a was a World War II veteran in the United States Marine Corps in Guadalcanal. I witnessed a few things that those guys went through and how they revisited some of that. Right. It's real. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And their response to it is real. The argument I think this person probably was trying to make, and he did it probably not very articulately, yeah. was it's not the person's response to it. It's the response that other people make to it on their behalf. Yeah. Well, this, not, is not, this is not an easy problem. This is not an easy problem to even start to begin to examine. Right, right, right. Definitely not, not, for, the, not for this podcast. <laughs> well, uh you know, it, it, it brings it, what it does is it, it it should make people think. You know, kind of going through all the things that you've discussed is it's really what needs to happen is people really need to start one paying better attention to others, uh, have more engagement with others, um, and therefore I think a lot of you know understanding how to watch people. Understand, like I said, we talked about earlier, the baseline. Understand who this is, who this person is. You know, this is how they always are. You know, it, it, but and not being able to see and understand when things change or things are you know, become different behaviors and that sort of thing. So, uh, man, it's, it's a good conversation. We could go on you for know, hours with women, this. Women have the greatest mechanism for doing this, and it's far better than men, in my opinion. Women's intuition. Right. And I think, you know, if you go back and read anything by Gavin DeBecker, he, he spends a little bit of time talking about this. Right. Women have a very good bullshit meter. Yep. You know, but a lot of times what gets them in trouble is they talk themselves out of it. No, no, no. Don't ladies out there that you're listening to us. Don't do that. Don't don't please, for God's sakes, listen to me on this. Don't do that. Right. If something's telling you something's wrong, probably is. Listen to it. Yes. Yeah. And act on it accordingly. Yeah. It just, there is, 
you know, in the big scheme of things, Glenn, if you're wrong, you, you, okay, I, I made myself look like a fool. I got egg on my face, and I beg your forgiveness. Right. But if you you're know, right. But if you're right, you know, you know, trust me, you, the, the rewards you reap will be far better than the consequences. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, Absolutely. You know, you know, I'm so, you know, like I said, if you're wrong, you just, you know, if, if, if the relationship is, is still repairable after you've made a, a, a an error in judgment about this person, look, you know, I was con- concerned for my safety. I'm sorry. And please forgive me. And I, and I, I want to continue in a, in a relationship with you, whether it be, you know, in friendship, you know, romantic, whatever the case may be. But I, I, I said this to women a hundred thousand times and, and please hear this for those of you who are listening to me. Um, uh, I'd much rather you ask for forgiveness than for us to be talking about you by your gravesides. That's right. That's right. You know, I can get you over being embarrassed. I can't get you over being raped. Damn. So. Well, dude, that's that's right there. It's, it's a powerful. It's a powerful conversation. I think it's a conversation. I think it's something that everybody really needs to think more about. Because it's become such a prevalent thing in our society. And, you know, I guess that it, it, it's good to start that conversation. And, and, and I think people really need to, to take notice. Um, you know, we, we talk, oh, that person's crazy. Well, they might not necessarily be crazy, but they, they may have something else going on. And, uh, you know, being to understand, understand, like earlier you talked about the pressure cooker. Understand how to see things, you know, try to pick out those things before they happen. Pay attention. You know, you may be able to save yourself and those around you a whole lot of headache and heartache. I mean, you know, Glenn, you look at, I'll just throw out a couple of names, you know, Alex Jones. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I still have not gotten anybody to explain to me, you know, okay, he's crazy. Well, then how does he end up being right half the time? That's true. The problem with it is, is, I mean, the way this, this person approaches things and approaches people uh, he comes across as, as you know, as a he's stalk man. raving mad. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'd probably argue that if you just change your delivery, you know, probably some people would start paying attention to you. Right. You know, I don't listen to him. I, yeah. I don't. I mean, it just that's just not my cup of tea. Right. But on the few times I'm like, all right, and he out of curiosity, I'm like, what, what's what's all the fuss here? You know, yeah. like you know, first ten minutes you're in, you're like, what the hell am I doing? Yeah. You know, you listen to some of our politicians. We had a, a United States congressman one time that, that stated he was concerned about too many Marines being on Guam because of my capsize. Okay. Yeah. 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 If you're worried about people overturning an island, sir, you've got no business holding public office. That's exactly right. Uh, and, and again, that's for a whole other conversation, too. Yeah. But, uh, well, oh, man, that, that, Really, again, for everybody, that that's an eye-opening conversation. And again, while we can't cover all those aspects, we just don't have those kind of hours to. We don't have that much tape to record on, <laughs> or hard drive space. But uh, what we wanted to do is jar to jar your thinking process. You know, uh, make it you know, something that's that's on your mind, and that when you're dealing with people, uh, you pay attention to things. And uh, you know, again, the way our society is. Uh, the way things have gotten, I think it's not more important now than probably ever to you know know your neighbors, to know those coworkers, to understand people's normal behavior. So whenever there's something does change, you understand and see that change. I want you to think about this, Glenn. You just said something that I think is profound, and I don't even know if you, if you, if you need to know what you said. <clears throat> As Christians, we're told to love our neighbor. Uh huh. How can you love them if you don't know them? That's true. You know, is that not an inherent part of loving somebody? Uh, it is. You're absolutely right. And you know, I have to love my neighbors. Well, <laughs> yeah. That's a whole other conversation, too. Absolutely. <laughs> I, ain't, but, I, uh, I ain't a five step in that minefield. You're not getting me stuck oh in that. Oh, Lord. But anyway, I hope, I, again, I hope every, everybody out there, I hope you got something out of this. Like always, we, we try to talk about a topic that we feel is important, um, especially looking out at the world around us, seeing things that are going on uh, that we think it, it has value. 
And so, you know, with that, we'll, we're, we're over an hour tonight, so we're going to go ahead and we'll, we'll cap it off of that. Uh, if you guys, if you have short you know, stories you want to share, if you have opinions you want to share, um, your, your outlook on the whole conversation, you know, please let us know. You know, you can obviously comment in the, you know, below in the comment sections or, you know, send us a message, whatever. We'd love to talk to you, hear from you. But uh, until next time, you guys, please make sure you hit that like, subscribe, notification bell. Uh, come in, join the conversation with us. And uh, until next time, we will see you. Y'all take care. We'll see you soon. Thank you.